We're continuing our series uh, in the sessions that I have the honor of speaking to you called Faith Prepares. And we've really been talking about, you know, some of the things that pastors have been talking about here on Sunday mornings about the garden of your heart, sowing the word, the sower sows the word, really going over that parable. Because it's imperative for us that we, we get to that place where we are living out of the kingdom of God. We're living not, not just, yeah, we're in the world, but we're not living in this world. You know what I mean? We're not living a part of this world's system. We're living a part of the kingdom of God. We, you and I, as children of God, we're citizens of heaven, citizens of the kingdom of God. We're a part of a different economy. We're a part of a different structure than just what's going on down here in the world. And we're supposed to be, that's right, taken over. We're supposed to be occupied. That's what Jesus said, occupy till I come. Not just sitting here trying to survive and just trying to make it. No, the Lord wants for us to be so blessed, so generous that we're actually influencing and changing the world that we live in. Amen. And the only way we're going to do that is to get this principle right here that Jesus taught us. It's in uh, Matthew 13, Mark chapter 4, I think it's Luke chapter 8. Jesus talked about these things, about the parable of the sower. And he basically said, this is the granddaddy of all parables. Meaning you got to understand this. If you don't understand this, you won't understand any other parable he taught. Anything else. And it's good. We'll focus on other things. That's important. But Jesus said this is really important. So it's really important, right? Yes. If Jesus called attention to this and he said this is important, then we're going to spend some time learning about it. We're going to spend some time getting, getting a revelation, getting a true revelation of what he's saying. Yes, sir. And a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago when I last taught you guys and uh, lesson three, we were talking about the second kind of ground with pressure, withstanding pressure, how to withstand pressure. When pressure comes, for the word's sake, what do we do? And we talked about those things, and for sake of time, we're not going to go over that. But tonight, we're really going to talk about the third type of ground. And I believe for a lot of people, this is where a lot of the church is. They reside right here in the third type of ground. And if you can, let's go, over, go ahead and go over to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We're going to read a couple of verses here. For sake of time, we're not going to read the whole story. I'm sure you've heard it a few times by now. <laughs> With the parable of the sower, we're not going to go through that. But we're just going to pick up a couple of verses because we're going to have to move pretty quick to get where I believe we want to go tonight, okay? So we're going to start reading verse number 18. And this is Jesus' explanation of the parable. And this is the third type of ground. He said, And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things enter in. If you've got a Bible, if you're taking notes, I want you to really highlight those two words. Enter in or entering in, whatever your translation says. That's going to be really important. Those things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. It proves unfruitful. Now let me ask you this. Surely we have established this by now. Does the word work? Yes. Come on, church. Yeah, With right. conviction, the word works every time. Right. But it, it's, it's not the seed's fault if it's not fruitful. Amen. Now that's not, we're, not here, we're not here for condemnation's sake, but there is a responsibility that you and I have as believers to make sure the soil of our heart is ready and available for the seed of the word of God to bear fruit. The seed, listen, the word of God is the most powerful changing agent in human history. Any situation you have, listen, this is what fixes your marriage. This is what fixes your relationships. This is what heals your body. This is what gives you prosperity and blessing and success in your life. This is what helps you have a strong, intimate relationship with your heavenly father. It's this right here. It's not the word's fault, but we've got to take some responsibility. Let's, let's do a, a genuine, authentic heart examination and make sure that when the word of God is sown, that, that the potential that it has to bear fruit, it actually carries it out. Amen. And this one right here, like I said, I think this is where most people are right here. It's this third type of ground. Yes, the word is sown. And listen, this is, this is correction that I've received from the Lord as recent as this morning. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, it's not just practicing what you preach, but it's preaching what you practice, right? Yeah, yeah. And so this was correction that the Lord brought to me. And so I, I don't think I'm the only one <laughs> that's sitting here in this boat. 
But when, it, when he's talking about this, listen, I am so faithful. I know the importance of the word. I was brought up. You've heard me talk about my upbringing before. We were brought up with the importance of the word. It was the word in the morning. It was the word in the afternoon. It was the word at night. All day, every day, it was the word of God. Whenever we needed something, go to mom and dad, and they ask us, what's the word say? I don't know. <laughs> but it taught us to always run to the word first. Amen. And so I know the importance of sowing the word. Amen. Amen. And I've been so faithful. Not, I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm, I'm getting to a point. I've been faithful and diligent to sow the word. But at the same time, for the last season of my life, as busy as I've been, I've been equally as faithful to sow seeds of stress, to sow seeds of anxiety. And those things just choke the word right on out. As fast as, fast as you're sowing the word, and then I'm sowing seeds of stress and anxiety and worry, taking the care of, of my own life and the care of what's going on for me, and then all of a sudden just throw that in and mix that in with the word, and it just chokes the word right out. And it's really important, this, like what I just highlighted just a few moments ago, where it says that those things enter in. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire of other things, enter in. You know, it's possible to live this life free of care. Yes, it is. It's possible. Yes, it is. Did Jesus do that? Yes, he did. Absolutely, he did. Jesus set a good example for us of how to live and operate in peace every day. Regardless of what's happening around me, regardless of what's happening in the natural realm, listen, that's where the enemy wants to get you. He wants to get you to start operating out here again, to stop operating in faith, to stop operating by what the word says and go back to the natural realm. Well, how do you feel? Just tell me how you feel. No, let's, my feelings are real. We're not saying that they're not. God created your emotions. God created your feelings. That's a part of your soul. That's one third of who you are. But that is not supposed to be leading and guiding my life. Right, that's right. There you go. They're fine to have in the car. They should just not be driving the car. Y'all know people in your life? It's good to have them in the car, but you're really scared when they get behind the wheel of the car. <laughs> And you're like, no, you know, it's fine. I'll come pick you up. Maybe you don't pick me up. <laughs> I'd rather you not. I'll just, I feel a lot safer if you're not driving. You need to get that way with your feelings. You know, I'll come pick you up. You don't need to come and drive me around. I'll come take you. I don't trust you behind the wheel of my life. <laughs> right? And so it's important. Feelings, we're not just sitting here just disregarding them and pretending like they don't exist. Amen. That's not what we're supposed to do. In Genesis chapter 15, we see the story of Abram. This is before God changed his name to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, God showed up to him, to Abram, and said, Behold, Abram, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. Man, what a great thing for God, the Almighty God, planet creator, to come and say to you, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. And you know what Abram, his response to that was? It was frustration. It was frustration. He said, Lord, what are you going to give me? Because I'm childless. You haven't given me what you promised me. So what are you going to give me instead? And he's trying to settle and negotiate with God. But I want you to notice something, though. I think it's around verse 3 or so. God did not get angry with Abram for being frustrated. God does not get angry with you right. for feeling frustrated. Now, don't mishear me. Frustration is not faith. If you're frustrated, you're not in faith. Let's, <laughs> let's just be real about it. Let's be authentic. Let's be genuine and sincere. If you're frustrated, that's not faith. But there is grace for frustration. Yes, that if you're frustrated, you can go to God. You don't have to wait, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix my feelings and then I'll go to God. No, go, go to God first. That's what Abram did. Abram didn't say, well, uh, you know, I appreciate you reminding me. You know, God said, I'm your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Abram didn't feel like he had to hide his frustration from God. There was grace for that. There's grace for you and I when we're frustrated, when our feelings are out of whack. Yep. And God can help you. And you know what God did with Abram? He said, no, Abram, I'm not going to come in and look at your problem. 
We're not going to... Abram was asking God to change his focus. God, I need you to see what I'm going through. And Abram said, or God replied to Abram and said, no, I need you to change your focus. You're frustrated because your focus is on the wrong thing. You're frustrated because you're focused on lack. You're frustrated because you're not focusing on me. Because I don't have your attention. That's why you're frustrated. That's why you're out of peace. That's why you're anxious and worried and full of care. Is because you're not attending to my word. But God met him right where he was. One minister says it this way, and this is absolutely the truth. God will always meet you where you are, but he can never meet you where you pretend to be. Don't pretend that, man, I got, I got all this thing together. I got this whole thing. I got this whole thing figured out. This whole faith thing, I got it. No, you don't. <laughs> you're not walking in perfection of faith. I know you're not because you're not Jesus. I know you're not doing that. We all have shortcomings, we all have mistakes, and we all have seasons of life where we do shift our focus off of Jesus and onto these things. And it's easy to do that. It's easy to slip back in to the flesh and to the natural and look at, well, how do I feel? What do I see? And that's what we're being driven by. It's easy to do those things. But what God did for Abram is he called his attention to something else. He called his attention to get his faith stirred up again. What did he say? He said, go outside, count the stars. If you can number them, that'll be the number of your descendants. Go during the day. God was giving Abram something to look at day and night, a constant reminder of his, of his promise, a constant reminder of his faithfulness, that he is faithful to his word. And so he said, during the day, go count the sand on the shore. If you can number them, that'll be the number of your descendants. What was God doing? Not getting on to him for being frustrated, but let's, let's, let's turn the focus. Let's shift your attention. Let's get faith stirred up again. It feels like it's just so compact because, because you're just so compacted by the cares of this world. You know, in Mark chapter 4, where it says that, that word choke, it's also the same Greek word that was used in Mark chapter 5 when it was talking about the crowd that was thronging Jesus. You know, with the woman with the issue of blood. It says people were thronging him. And so it's, it, it's that same idea. It carries that same idea of, of the cares of this world just coming in and choking out the word. Because there's so much pressure. Because there's so much care. There's so much anxiety. There's, uh, we've slipped back over into the flesh and operating in the natural. And then now the word of God and your faith just feels so compacted and pressed. And it's interesting because you think about that word choke and it just completely chokes out the word. I always thought that was a very interesting way of putting that, to choke out the word. Y'all know what it means to choke? Does anybody want to volunteer and I can show you what it means to be choked? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> but it takes away your voice. And so the cares of this world, the purpose that they're even here, they're designed to take away the voice of faith. They're designed to remove God's voice from your life. And the enemy loves, I think it's what my, my, my dad calls, it's the pile-on technique. You know what I'm talking about? Where it's not just one thing. It's one thing and another thing and another thing, and everywhere you look, it just seems like it's just stuff that you got to deal with, that you got to handle. I mean, I felt that way a lot recently. There's just things, there's just things going on and you just learn, you have to learn how to balance things in your life and you got to learn to follow the, the peace of God and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And it, it's, it's, sometimes it's a process, just learning how to do that. But man, it's, th this whole thing, you're supposed to be living life without these things entering in. Do y'all remember, I think, is it, is it John 4 with the woman at the well? When Jesus met her? And it says, uh, Jesus being wearied from his journey. I think a lot of people can say the same thing about where they are right now. Yeah. Jesus being wearied from his journey. Tired. Jesus. And th there's, there's, a, there's an amount of comfort to that. That, you know, Jesus, our Lord Jesus, also got tired. But it's interesting because... It, he had weariness in his body. 
He was tired. But that never got in. The weariness on the outside never got inside. Because what did he do next? Ministered to this woman. Took the time to minister to minister grace and love to this woman. Changed her world and changed her life forever. And she became the first evangelist because she went around to the entire city and told everybody about Jesus. Rocked her world forever. But then Jesus, his disciples get back with some food and Jesus obviously looked different because they noticed a difference about him. He was wearied and now he's not. Well, Jesus didn't take a nap. He actually ministered to somebody else. He was still pouring out to somebody else. And then they got there and Jesus, is, this is my paraphrase, he said, I already ate, fellas. And they're like, who brought him food? I thought we were bringing him food. And Jesus said, I've got food y'all don't know about. Right. <laughs> Which you know confused them. But you know what that tells me? If you're wearied and you're tired, do what God's asked you to do. Go back to what God's asked you to do because there's life in that. Even if it's effort from you, from your natural physical body, you can do effort from a place of peace. You can work on the outside from a place of rest on the inside. I mean, you'll find yourself strengthened and replenished because that anointing that's flowing through you to somebody else by you doing what God told you to do Man, it replenishes you, it refreshes you, feeds you. But we've got to get to the place where we're not feeding on the cares of this world. What does it mean to feed on? Let's, let's, let's change the word feed to meditate. Don't meditate on these things. Don't give care and anxiety mind time. Don't give it mind time. Let's go over, can you pull up Luke chapter 10 out of the Passion? I want to show you guys this. For sake of time, we're just going to read it out of the Passion Translation. We read this in our last lesson, but there, out of the Passion Translation, it brings out a couple of different things. This is the story of Mary and Martha. When Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to His words and being fed off of His words, but then Martha is distracted and concerned with serving. But in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their journey, they came to a village where a woman welcomed Jesus into her home. Her name was Martha, and she had a sister named Mary. Mary sat down attentively. Notice that. Mary sat down attentively before the master, absorbing every revelation he shared. You know, it's impossible to absorb revelation from Jesus apart from Jesus. <laughs> You know, the other people who might, have been, who might have been in that house but not at Jesus' feet didn't receive from Jesus. Not because He wasn't willing to give, but because they weren't there. And we're trying to receive from Jesus without spending time with Jesus. Doesn't happen. Well, I'm frustrated because, God, I just feel like you're not... I, I, need, I need you to, to, to minister to me. I need you to minister strength to me again. But I'm going to go on my merry way and I'm going to do my thing. If you could just do that for me later as I go about. Can he do that? Yes. But it's important for you to spend time with him. Amen. Spending time at the feet of Jesus. I think it's the New King James that says this is the one thing that's necessary. There's a lot of things that you feel like you've got to do. This is number one. Amen. This is number one. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Listening to the word of Jesus. Absorbing every revelation he shared. But Martha became exasperated by finishing the numerous household chores in preparation for her guests. So she interrupted Jesus and said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me to do all the work by myself? You should tell her to get up and help me. When you're frustrated... You never, ever, ever, ever are giving words of life to somebody else. You're in need of them yourself, but you're so focused and distracted by what you're doing, by the things that you feel like you have to do right now. I have to do this now. I have to do this now. 
The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, it says that the, 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 he that believeth doesn't work in haste. He that believeth doesn't work in haste. What does that mean? I'm not in a rush. You can do things quickly, but doing things rushed are very different. Yes. Having a feeling of, of, of doing things fast or quick versus doing them rushed, big difference. Big difference. But notice what Jesus said. Jesus wasn't mad at Martha. How dare you speak to me? You interrupted my sermon. How dare you? You're rude, right? Jesus didn't respond that way. Well, how did he respond? Notice this in verse 41. He's, the Lord answered her, Martha, my beloved Martha. Jesus is again establishing relationship with her. Yes, he's going to, to, to issue some correction that was desperately needed for her. But the first thing Jesus wanted her to remember was his love for her. Martha, I know you're frustrated, but remember I love you. Let's come back to this first. Let's come back to the very foundation of the entire gospel. It's the love of God. It's the very foundation for everything. It's the very fact that God just loves you so much that he gave you Jesus. God loved you so much that he gave you Jesus, his very best. And with Jesus, he said, I'll give you everything that pertains to life and godliness. I'll just go ahead and take care of every need you ever have. That's our wonderful, generous, gracious God. That's wild, unconditional love. And this is what Jesus was, was reminding Martha of. Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you upset and troubled? Notice this. Pulled away by all these many distractions. You want to know the fastest way to get frustrated is get distracted. The fastest way to let the cares of this world, to let anxiety and fear and worry in, is to get distracted, is to get pulled away. Why are you upset? Why are you so troubled? She forgot who was sitting in her house. She forgot who was in her home. It's Jesus, the one who fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. It's the one who fed 4,000. Again, Jesus multiplying food. Jesus could have handled that for her. He said, listen, serving is not wrong. Y'all hear me? Serving is not a bad thing. When, do, when, do, when does serving become bad? When it takes priority over your intimacy with Jesus. When it takes priority over hearing him. That's when serving becomes a problem. Listen, we should be serving out of the overflow that we receive from Jesus, not in place of being with Jesus. Pastor shared this story on Sunday. This woman who wrote so many songs back in the 80s for, for churches and, and for worship, she wrote so many things, so many songs. And she, went, she actually died and went to heaven. And when she got there, y'all remember on Sunday, pastor shared this. She died and she got there and she talked to Jesus and she was saying, I got to go back. I got so much to do. I have to go back. I got to go back. And Jesus looked at her and said, you don't owe me anything. Hallelujah. And that just radically changed her world. Amen. And that'll change your world. You don't owe Jesus anything. Right. I hear, I hear it said often, and I understand the context and what they mean behind it, that, that God, I owe you my life. And I understand what you're saying, but that's also not true. Because then it feels like, like, we're, like you're not in debt to God. God's not saying that you've got to make payments on your salvation. That's, right. you saved them all. that's, not, what, that's not how this thing works. That's the beauty of grace. Amen. It seems too good to be true. It's like there's no way. Like I've, There's got to be something. It's, it's the beauty of God's unconditional love and grace. Jesus finished the work on the cross. The entire work of salvation and redemption has been finished. Now listen, we serve God because we love God. And we love God because He first loved us. We can't get this thing twisted. One minister says it this way, a lot of Christians have spiritual dyslexia. They just got this thing backwards. They're switching stuff. <laughs> 
Jesus said, why are you so upset and troubled, pulled away by all these many distractions? Are they really that important? Now listen, the Lord knows the stuff that you have to do. Showing up to your job on time is important. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Listen, in this life, let's be good representations of Jesus. Let's be people of excellence. Let's have a heart and a spirit of excellence in all that we do. Let's not have a heart of laziness, right? Let's not be lethargic and lackadaisical. Let's represent Jesus well. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's, let's be people of excellence, which means we will leave every place we go to better than we found it. Amen? So there are things that are important in your life. Doing what God's called you to do, that's important. Ministering to people in your life, that's important. Serving people in your life, serving church, serving God in church, these things are so important. But they are not the most important. Sometimes it's so easy to just let that take the most, the, the number one priority. I've got so much to do. There are people who are counting on me. I know that. Believe me, I get it. There are people who are counting on you. And you do need to be a dependable, faithful person. And it's great that people do find you dependable, faithful, and that they can rely on you. That's great. But if you don't have anything to give them from Jesus, what are you giving them? Listen, we're all ministers, right? We're all ministers of the gospel. Whether you stand up on a pulpit, preach a sermon, that doesn't make you a minister. You, as a child of God, you're a minister of Jesus Christ. Amen? Every one of us in here are ministers. And listen, this is what's so important. Whatever's in your heart right now is what you're ministering to other people. If your heart is full of stress, anxiety, fear, and care, guess what you're ministering to other people? Same thing. If your heart is hurting, guess what you're ministering to other people? It's important. This, man, this is so important. If your heart is full of legalism, what are you ministering to other people? It's the, it's the same thing. Like whatever your heart is full of, that's what you're ministering. That's what you're giving out. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. Out of the abundance, it's that overflow. It's whatever's in there, man. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at a couple of things here. You guys all right? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love the words of Jesus. But man, this is, this is what I want tonight. We're talking about peace. We're talking about not letting cares come in. We're talking about these things, but I want it to be something that we're not just talking about. I want this to fill the room before you leave. Amen. Before you leave, I want the peace of God to overwhelm you. Amen. Thank you Jesus. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 6. These are familiar verses of Scripture. It's not you know, anything new. But in Matthew chapter 6, we're starting in verse number 25. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. That word, do not be, it's, it's more accurately translated, you're doing this. I need you to stop doing this. <laughs> when I was growing up, what I heard, <laughs> I heard these, this one word from my mom a lot, stop. <laughs> so that means I'm doing something that's not good for me, that's not beneficial, that could potentially hurt me, stop. Somebody with wisdom and love for me needed to tell me to stop. And that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not giving you a law. Jesus is going to give you the reason why. That's the difference. Law says just stop. It's demanding. But grace always gives you the supply for whatever is being asked. It's the empowerment to do what's being asked. Jesus is saying, stop being anxious about your life. And look at this. He says, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Jesus is again reminding who he was talking to, but this is just as real for you as anybody else. Take this like Jesus is talking to you face yes. to face. Amen. Are you Amen. not of more valuable? Are you not of more value than the birds? Aren't you more valuable than they are? They don't do a thing. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't work. They don't do anything. They don't make a living. 
Listen, get that word out of your head. You don't earn a living. Listen, you do work, right? You work. A man is worth his wage. That's what the Bible says. You do work. But we're not earning a living. <laughs> when, you're, when you're operating in, in, in your place and your grace, and the blessing of God is all over you. It, it, may be, it may be effort. That's right, but it's not toil. Man, that's the difference. Yeah. Proverbs 10, 22. It says, wow. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, yeah. and it adds no sorrow with it. That word sorrow is translated toil. You know what yeah. toil is? Hard work and sweat. It's laborious work. Doesn't mean we don't work hard, but our motivation is different. Amen? Are you, not of more valuable, are you not of more value than the birds? Your heavenly Father takes care of every single one of them. Amen. Every bird on the... Think about that. Think about how many birds there are. Just in the state of Georgia, how many birds there are. Is there any one person who could actually take care of the birds? Even in your backyard, could you take care of every bird there is? Absolutely not. But your heavenly Father is taking care of the birds in the entire backyard of the whole globe. Every bird there is, that your Heavenly Father is feeding them and taking care of them. And you know something? I've never seen a bird pacing on a limb outside of his nest, wondering where his next meal is coming from. I've never seen a stressed out, worried bird. Have you? They're not worried. They're not worried. Nor should you be. And this is what Jesus is saying. Stop worrying about your life. You're more valuable than the birds and God's taking care of every one of them. He'll take care of you. He'll take good care of you. And which of you, verse 27, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Man, that's important right there. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. How do they grow? It's grace growth. It's not toil and it's not through spinning. It's not through hard, laborious effort. It's not through trying to earn it. They don't earn their growth. It's grace growth. And your life, and listen, just about in every area, except for maybe your waistline, growth is always a good thing. Right? <laughs> Growth and increase is always great. It's always a good thing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> but I can tell you what's not a good thing? Toil. There's this, this story I heard about this guy one time. His goal was to retire by age 40. So he had three jobs. This is insane to me. I don't know how how this guy could do anything. He wasn't married. He said he'll get married when he's retired. So he worked three jobs. He would wake up at like 4.30 in the morning, go to his first job, work there from like 5.30 until like 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, get done and go straight over to his next job and work till about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And then on the weekends when he was off of those two jobs, he'd go work his third job as a weekend job. He worked seven days a week Never took a vacation. He said, I'll travel. When I'm retired, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to work hard. I'm going to save my money, and then I'll live my life. You know what happened? He died of a massive heart attack before he ever even reached age 40. Accumulated a lot of money and never actually lived his life. A lot of people may not be that extreme, but are still living with the same kind of anxiety and stress. I read this report one time. It said that it was anywhere between 75 to 90% of all illnesses are somehow connected to stress. That, and this, this one doctor, he said, if we could find the cure for stress, we could cure so many diseases that are plaguing humanity. Boy, if I got good news for him and good news for you, there is a cure for stress and anxiety. <laughs> Praise God. There is a cure. It's the peace of God. Verse 29, it says, Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, But if God so clothes the, the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, 
Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Verse 31. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying. That goes back to what we talked about in Mark chapter 4, where the cares of this world, stress and anxiety, choking out the word, taking away its voice. Don't give voice to anxiety. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, this is how anxiety and the cares of this world get in. You give a voice to them. You give a voice to them. Don't be anxious, saying. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians chapter 4. Um, he was talking about how the, the church at Philippi had just sown an offering, sowed a, a financial seed into his ministry. And it came in his time of need. But he said, I don't speak in regard to need. Husbands and wives especially, listen up. Be careful. Be cautious how much you're talking to each other about the need. What's happening when you do that? You're magnifying the need. And this small problem that is so easy for God becomes life's biggest issue because you magnified it because it got so big to you. I've said this before, but if I were to hold a magnifying glass up to the words on this Bible, what would everybody say happens? It says, we, we would think that it's getting bigger, right? It's not getting bigger. It just got bigger to me. It got bigger in my eyes. It got bigger in my perspective because I put the magnifying glass on this. The words didn't actually change size. This book didn't actually just grow. It just got bigger to me. And this is what's happening when you talk about Jesus, when you talk about him, when, you, when you, your voice, you're giving a voice to his word, giving a voice to your faith in his word. Oh man, it's, he's getting bigger. He's getting bigger. Yeah, he's getting bigger in your eyes. He's getting bigger to you. Amen. That's why some people don't understand it, why you can live and walk by faith, even though you're going through hell on earth. It's because of what I see is different than what you see. I see my God is my God is big enough, strong enough, and well able, and He keeps His promises. Amen. Amen. But the opposite is is also true. This is why you can have people of faith confused by people who are giving voice to anxiety. Oh, God can handle that. Oh man, I don't know if He can or not. This is huge. I've dealt with this sickness my entire life. I don't even know what life looks like without this disease. Oh man, this thing, you know, the doctors say there is no cure for it. And, you know, they say maybe we can take some medication or do a surgery and we can try to keep it at bay. Oh, but the answer is in Jesus. <laughs> oh man, this bill, I got this unexpected bill. Man, I was not ready for this. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know how to pay for this. I don't have enough for this. And how, how can I get more money every month? I got to figure this out. Maybe I can get a second or a third job. Maybe I can do. Uh, let's be careful about making yourself your own source of anything. Whatever you look to yourself for, <laughs> you have to sustain that. <laughs> and we know good and well you're not able to sustain anything <laughs> on your own in this life. Eventually, your resources will run out. Maybe it's your own, in, maybe it's your energy. I got enough energy for that. I can do that. Eventually, you will run out. Yep. You will run out of your own strength. Listen, I'm like the Energizer Bunny. That's what me and my wife kid, like I can keep going, I can keep going, I can keep going and just not really need to take a break. But I found out recently that Jonathan does eventually does, he does have to take a break. He really do have to take a break. You think you can keep going on your own? <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> you'll have to stop. You will run out. You're not an endless source for, of anything. <laughs> Whatever you make yourself source of in your life, man, you've got to sustain that. And you don't have an endless supply. Eventually, you run out. And then what? 
Now what do you do? Now what do you do? We got to go back to Jesus. <laughs> we have to go back to Jesus. What I wrote when I was studying for this, there's a couple of notes that I wrote down and this was, it ministered to me and I believe it'll minister to you too. Whatever you're trying to be for yourself in a position that only God can be for you, that's the thorns of self-effort. That's the thorns that we were talking about in Mark chapter 4. That's those thorns. It's whatever I put myself, whatever position I put myself in to take the place of God. Whenever, whatever aspect or facet of life that I put myself in as God of, I am Lord of this in my life. And we don't ever vocalize that, but that's exactly what we do. If you're looking to yourself, you've made yourself Lord of that part. Okay? If you're looking to yourself, you've made yourself God of that part of your life. All right? But whatever I put myself, whatever I'm looking to myself for, to be for myself, man, that's the thorns that come in and choke out the word. Do y'all know the first time that thorns are mentioned in Scripture? It's in Genesis chapter 3. It's right after the fall of man. Right after the fall of man. The, the thorns that, that God refers to, he's talking about, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to toil. There will be thorns that you're going to have to contend with in your harvest from here on out. Thorns are always associated with toil and with the curse. But here's the good news. Here's the good news about that. Come on, what did Jesus bear on the cross for us? A crown of thorns. Jesus bore the curse on his own body on the tree. Jesus bore the curse of toil. Jesus bore the curse of self-effort for you on your behalf. Man, I don't have to give in to toil. I don't have to give in to the lie and the deception of the enemy that I've got to earn everything from God. I mean, you want to talk about faith repairs? This is faith repairs 101. You understanding and having a revelation of the grace of God. It's a constant conversation between grace and faith. Grace says, here's this. Faith says, thank you. I received that. Faith is not about trying to conjure something up. It's not about trying to create something where it's not there. Grace made it. Faith takes it. And that's, that's as easy as it gets. But it, it, it's, it's, it's easy. I don't want to say it's as easy as it gets. It's simple. It's not always easy on your flesh because your flesh wants to play a part. And you're like, well, there's got to, I got to, there's got to be something I do. And if there is, the Lord will tell you that. If there's some wisdom that needs to be applied to your life, maybe it's in, in the health of your physical body and the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom. He'll drop some wisdom on the inside of you that says, okay, the real, the real core of that issue is this. So let's change your diet and let's not eat that anymore. And that wisdom, man, that happened to somebody here in this church. They had stage four kidney failure. <laughs> and the Lord said, I need you to cut out all the Diet Cokes. Okay, great. That was wisdom. Next time she went back, Completely healed. <laughs> and so sometimes it's just wisdom and the Lord will, he will inform you of that. Yes, he does. Guess what though? If you're not listening, if you're still out here trying to make stuff happen on your own, you're not even available to listen to him. It's not that God's withholding from you. God, when are you going to give that? When are you going to do this? When are you going to finally come through for me? And God's like, I've been trying to tell you this whole time. I've been trying to give you wisdom for three years on this and you haven't listened to me. And again, God's not mad. God's not upset. And God's not withholding. But it's the cares of this world that get in and just choke it out. In this life, you and I, especially now more than ever, we are bombarded with other mindsets and imaginations from the enemy that don't line up with the Word of God. It is a constant influx of the world's way of thinking that you and I do have to contend with on a daily basis. Through TV, music, social media, news outlets, you name it, magazines, you name it, it's there. Just people in general. 
And they're constantly there to offer up a different way of thinking that's contradicting the Word of God. You ask the average person who's not living and walking by faith if they're concerned right now, <laughs> what kind of an answer do you think you're going to get? How many people are actually living and walking in peace that aren't following Jesus? I'd say zero. <laughs> so why would I listen to them? Why would I glean from them? Listen, you know, we've got that constant influx. We've got that constant, you know, bombardment of imaginations and mindsets, trying to get the cares of this world, trying to get into your heart, trying to get in to choke out the Word of God. What do we need? Let's go over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Thank you, Jesus. Verse number six. It says, and do not be anxious. <laughs> Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Do not be anxious about anything. Oh, except for, for the health of your family. That's acceptable. I mean, that's reasonable, right? We can, we, we can worry about, about our kids, right? That's okay. That's not what he said. Oh, but it's responsible to, to be worried about your financial future. That's responsible. That's you being careful and cautious. That's a good thing. That's wisdom. Now, hold on a minute. Worry does not equal wisdom. Hello. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Notice this, and the peace of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, check this out, will guard. That's what you need. That constant bombardment, that invasion of the cares of this world, you need a guard. That word guard what it actually means, it carries with it, it's a reference to a military presence to prevent a hostile invasion. That's good. It's a reference to a military presence to prevent a hostile invasion. That's what it feels like sometimes, though, doesn't it? Like worry and anxiety, stress and care. Man, it feels like it's, it's just like this hostile invasion of your thought life. Your entire soul is now weighed down under the pressure of anxiety and worry. But if you've got a guard there, right. it's not getting in. <laughs> you've got that military presence to prevent that invasion so it never gets in. It's the peace of God. It's the peace of God. And it surpasses understanding. To me, that just means that, man, it doesn't even make sense that I'm at peace. It, I shouldn't be calm. I shouldn't have undisturbed composure, but I am <laughs> because I know where my help comes from. I know who my faith is in. I'm trusting Him. It's not up to me. It's not up to me to figure it out and make it happen and earn it and do this and do that. No, no, no. I trust Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. I know He's faithful. I know He's faithful. He's not leaving me, forsaking me, abandoning me, neglecting me. And the peace of God, man, it just rushes in and prevents all that garbage from getting in. You can be surrounded by these things, but that doesn't mean they have to get in. That's what we were talking about with Jesus in John 4. Wearied from his journey, he was tired on the outside, but he didn't let it in. And it's easy, listen, it's easy to let these things in. It's easy to feel like I've got to make this happen. It's easy to give in to stress and anxiety and worry. It's easy to let those cares get in and choke out the word. That's easy. It takes diligent effort. I said it takes diligent effort on your part to keep your mind renewed to the Word of God 
and keep your focus and attention on Him. I want to encourage you, man, just abandon your worries. <laughs> Whatever they are, your cares, whatever's caused anxiety in your life, just abandon it. Just let it go. Just leave it. You don't have to carry that with you through life. That's what Jesus was saying. Don't be anxious about anything. I don't think we got, we got to read that, but in verse number 33 of Matthew chapter 6, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Man, that's key. It's not earned. It's not deserved. You're seeking His righteousness. That's grace. That's a gift. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. In my Bible right there, I put a, a big arrow that says effortless. Whatever you're, whatever you're looking for, whatever you're trying to get, whatever you're worried about, can be added to you. And that's how God wants us to live our life. In peace, not in worry. In rest, not in anxiety. But I can tell you right now, folks, listen, listen to me. You will never be encouraged and you will never live in peace if you're not attending to the word. I promise you, I promise you, the further away you are from getting in the word, oh man, the more prone to frustration and anxiety you will be. I'm, that's not meant for condemnation. That's not meant, meant for shame or, or, or to guilt you. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is the answer to all that garbage is the Word. It's, it's running to the Word. Lord, what do you say? Lord, I know that, that, that anxiety is screaming at me in the face, but I don't want to voice that. I don't want to voice, I don't want to give a voice to anxiety. I don't want to give a voice to stress and care. So Lord, what do you say? Lord, right now my physical body is screaming in pain. Lord, I've had this condition. It's been a chronic disease and illness that I've had for X amount of years. Lord, I just, I need help. What does your word say, Lord? Will you reveal something to me from your word? You know what his word says? That by his stripes, we are healed. That he is the God who takes sickness away from our midst. Father, right now I don't have to, I don't have to give in to worry. Lord, I'm just going to choose to trust you as the healer of my body. Yes. Well, Pastor, that's easier said than done. It might be, but you got the help of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you that will help you tame your tongue and tame your mind. Amen. Well, it's just been a struggle financially. There's, there's always more month than money, and I just I don't really know how to fix that. Maybe I'd just get a second job. Maybe I'd get a third or fourth job. Or, Lord, I don't even know what to do. And, you know, my bank account's screaming at me. These bills are screaming at me. My kids need, have needs, and, Father, I don't really even have enough to, to take care of that. But I, I need something from your word. What's, what do you say? What do you say about it? I know what they're saying. I hear them loud and clear. But I don't want to give them a voice. Father, what do you say? The promise of the word of God says that he'll supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And that the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And that Jesus was rich, but for our sake he became very poor so that you through his poverty might be made rich, so that you always have an abundance, so that you can be generous and give to every good work, That's that right. you're blessed to be a blessing. That's, right. That's what the Word says. Amen. That's what we are. Oh, Father, my marriage, you know, my marriage is just so messed up. You know, we're not close anymore. We're not even friends anymore. I don't even know what to do. I don't even like being in the same room as that person. And... <laughs> You know, I, I hear the, the stress and the anxiety screaming at me. But Father, what do you say about that? Well, first, Jesus said that he is near to the brokenhearted. Amen. And he is the mender 
of the brokenhearted. Don't think for one minute that God can't restore a marriage. God can give you a love for your spouse like you've never had before. God, it just feels like I'm everywhere I'm looking, it's just defeat. I don't want to give voice to that anxiety. Lord, what do you say? God said that you're more than a conqueror through him who loves you. And thanks be to God who always causes you to triumph. Always, 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 always causes you to triumph in Christ Jesus. That's what the word says. Real quick, church, let's stand up on our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your peace. Thank you, Lord. You know, peace will just flood into your heart, flood into your mind, fill the atmosphere. The moment you start giving praise and thanksgiving to God. And I'm sure if we were to go around each person, you're all probably dealing with something. There's an opportunity for stress and anxiety. There's an opportunity for some type of care for you to take on for yourself. But instead of taking that and letting it in, let's just thank God. Whatever whatever care it is, and let's cast that over on the Lord. Let's give it to Him. The Lord cannot work on that as long as you've got the care. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I thank you for your peace. Thank you, Lord, for your peace that's guarding our hearts, guarding our minds. Lord, we're not going to give voice to anxiety, to the cares. But Father, we'll lend our voice to your praises. Lend our voice to your thanksgiving, Lord. And praise and magnify you above everything else. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the healer of our bodies. You are the healer of our hearts. You're the restorer of our souls. Thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are our great provider. You provide for every need, whatever it may be in our life. And Lord, you are our source of supply in every single area of our life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are the God who gives us direction. You are our guide in this life. Lord, you can tell us where to go. Lord, if we're stressing about a decision that we have to make, I thank you that you are our leader and our guide. And you know how to, how, to, how to direct us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You make clear the path and you order the steps of the righteous. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Worship you, Lord Jesus. Magnify you above everything else. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your peace. Your peace. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Your presence filling this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I felt this strong in my heart that there may be one or more people who, who need direction or need an answer. Kind of at a crossroads. You need wisdom. I want to encourage you. Wisdom is found in the presence of God. And I felt the Lord say this to me. Your direction will come from peace. You've been yielding to anxiety, yielding to worry, and yielding to care. But I felt the Lord say so strongly, 
Yield to me. Yield to my peace. Let me be what I want to be for you. Let me fill you. Let me be what only I can be. And this is where this is where you get tired. This is where exhaustion sets in. But man, you can just come to Jesus. Just yield to Jesus. Oh man. Thank you, Lord. Some of you have some big decisions on the horizon that you're trying to make. Oh man, the God of all peace will give you liberally the wisdom you need. The answer is not found in anxiety. The direction you need is not found in anxiety. It's found in yielding to Jesus. <laughs> There's a couple of you. You've needed direction. You've got some choices. But I can promise you, you're not going to find them until you slow down. I know it's easy to get hurried. But when you get hurried... You'll get worried. <laughs> it's okay to be busy as long as it's productive, but, but you, you make sure you're you, on the inside. You're resting in, in Jesus. You're, you're letting peace be the umpire, which means letting peace call the shots, okay? And I feel, I feel like the Lord's telling at least a couple of us to slow down. Listen, that's for me too. <laughs> to slow down, ease up a little bit. Because the Lord wants to make sure that He can direct your steps. Slow down. You'll find your direction. The Lord will order your steps. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for peace. Peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You don't have to be anxious about tomorrow, about next week. You don't have to be anxious about the next season of your life. Oh, man, you don't have to be anxious about any part of your future. The same God who loved you enough to give you Jesus loves you enough to put you on the path of righteousness, a path that drips with abundance. The Bible says that the path of the righteous grows ever brighter like the sun. Your path is not growing darker. It's not growing dimmer. And it's not full of shortage. Your path is full of abundance. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we lay hold of your word. Oh, Lord, we, we lay hold of your word. We know what you say is truthful. We know you're faithful. We know that he who promised is faithful to perform it. Father, we know you're faithful. We consider you faithful. We consider you able. We consider you as our source. Lord, we let go and abandon every worry, stress, and anxiety. Lord, we just, we drop that now. <laughs> We're not going to pick it back up. Lord, we humbly submit to you. And Lord, we receive your grace. We yield to your peace tonight, Lord. We yield to your Holy Spirit, to your presence. And Father, we'll be, we'll be careful, we'll be cautious. As we live and walk out, out of this building, we're not going to pick it back up. We're not going to pick up those cares again. 
We're not going to pick up those worries and anxieties. We're not going to go running back to them because of some weird level of comfort that we find in them. Lord, we abandon them to completely live and walk by faith in all that you ask us to do, Lord. Oh, man, this is where refreshing comes from. Times of refreshing coming from the presence of the Lord. Oh, Lord, you replenish our strength in your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen.